Pastor Mark Newman. I'm a retired pastor. I was in, at St. Peter Broadhead for 32 years. And the Lord has blessed me to be able to retire over to, uh, I'm a member at Bethany Fort Atkinson. And uh, it's my pleasure to share God's word with you this morning. Please rise. Begin our worship in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, our is God. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the highest above. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. We pray. Almighty God, you divide the day from the night. Drive far from us all wrong desires. Incline our hearts to keep your law and guide our feet in the way of peace. And having done your will with cheerfulness while it is day, grant that when evening comes, we may rejoice in giving you thanks. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, do we have children for a children's sermon today? What's your name? Kelly. 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 And your name? Amelia. Amelia. Well, it's nice to meet you. My name is Mark, Pastor Mark. Okay. Um, have you ever found something? Have you, was it was it valuable? No, not really. Well, when I was a little older than you. Um, the grocery store had coupons on the back of their receipts and I was, they had a really good one so I was digging, as I left the store I was digging the garbage can to get some more coupons. And I found a, found a bank envelope with $80 in it. That was cool. But I, so somebody probably needed it so I turned it in. And they got hold of me and said, nobody claimed it. So guess what? I got the $80. That was really cool. <laughs> so um, sometimes we find things. And in our gospel reading for this morning, a, a man found a treasure, but it wasn't his. And he did what he could. He did what was legal. To, so that he could actually own the treasure. He bought the piece of land. So then the, the treasure was his. And what God teaches us, one of the things God teaches us through that is that when we find Jesus in our lives, and I think the two of you have found Jesus in your life, you know he's your savior, Savior from to take away your sins. When you find that treasure, God tells us sell, to sell all you have and keep that treasure. Well, selling all we have is trying our very best, and we don't totally succeed. I know I don't, but try your very best to live for God, for Jesus, and make Him your greatest treasure, and He'll bless you forever and ever. Okay? So I, I hope and pray that you keep Jesus as a part of your life all, the, all your days, as long as you live. Okay? I guess Pastor has treats for you after the children's sermon, huh? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So you got a little hint of our gospel lesson for this morning, and for just as a sort of a little announcement, if if any of you want to stay for a Bible class, I did a Bible class on our gospel lesson. So, um, today's God's word from the Old Testament is First Kings three, beginning with verse five, and the Lord blessed Solomon with great wisdom to guide his people Israel. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, 
Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given us, him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. These are the words of our God. Our second lesson, the epistle, is from 1 Timothy 6, beginning with the 17th verse. And uh, that first paragraph of the reading is my sermon text for this morning. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, with some, which some have professed, and in so doing, have departed from the faith. Again, these are the words of our God. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel is written in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, beginning with the 44th verse. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearl, for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. These are the words of our Lord. We pray. O oh Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will, that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us join together, confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a goodly number of years now uh, ago, I had the privilege of attending a matinee of the movie Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with my grand grandboys. It was a rollicking fun movie that explained how, how the stars of the movie got their name, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And at the end of the movie, everyone was taught, or the moral of the story is, the key to life is friends working together, battling the evils of life or this world. But now as I, I, I watch the news every night and sometimes the six o'clock as well. Um, as I've watched, you now 10 years later, I'm starting to wonder if maybe society, since the biggest, uh, when they take polls, the biggest growth in churches is no church. It's, it doesn't shock me that society has started to believe that, and I think you know the phrase, coming together for this cause or for that cause is the key to life. Life will be good if we come together and do things that are good. I don't think the Apostle Paul had this as the key to life um, when he says, take hold of the life that is truly life. Today, let's look at Paul's thoughts and let's remember that they aren't just his thoughts, but they are the words of God the Holy Spirit under the theme, take hold of the life that is truly life. Pretty much everyone <clears throat> has a different opinion on what a person should do to enjoy life or what you need to have to enjoy life. The movie that I talked about said that having friends working together was how one enjoyed life. And I would imagine that there are some who might say that. Enjoying life to some would be Having, having dozens and dozens of people like you on Facebook. Others would say having a job that you enjoy is certainly a key to having a good life. Other would, others would say having a great hobby. Others might say having a good friend or a companion for a spouse. Maybe a couple of you might say having the Packers win a championship every year would make life really good. For many, enjoying life is having one or more things that keeps life exciting, living for the moment. I'm guessing that maybe there's a couple of you who would say just getting up in the morning is a good thing for life. According to God's word, having life that is truly life is being connected to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading for this morning encouraged us to do all that we can to get the life that is truly life when it spoke of the man who found the hidden treasure and went and bought the land so that the treasure was his and that merchant who sold everything he had to get that pearl of great value. There's an interesting passage that came to mind as I thought about this. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. <clears throat> That's the words of God to us. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. 
I did like this section of 1 Timothy for our sermon this morning because it puts into Jesus' words, or puts Jesus' words into something we can grasp a little more easily. In the gospel, I don't know, I, I've sat in a pew and heard these words before, sort of scratched my head at what God was trying to tell me to do um, with those with those first two parables. Um, so it didn't give you something that you could take home from church and say, this is something I might do. I might change in my life. First Timothy teaches, teaches the lesson in what I'd say more concrete terms. It reminds us of what we tend to do as sinful human beings and then helps us focus on what is better in the eyes of God. Paul begins, command those who are rich in this present world. Well, some of us might certainly be thinking, well, he's not talking to me. He's talking to someone that has far more than they need to get through life. But I don't think so. Even the poorest among us, I would say, lives better than three quarter of the world, maybe more. We eat what we want, when we want. Um, we can go to a restaurant if we so wish and have someone make our food for us. Actually, there's nothing wrong with being rich. God doesn't condemn being rich in the Bible. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all rich. Think of Abraham. 300 plus servants that could go out and be an army when the king of Sodom and his nephew Lot were taken into exile. He chased them down with his men, but they had wives and children. So he had a great number of people that, that was being rich. And, Isaac and J Jacob inherited all of, uh, these things. Jacob had tons of flocks, if you read that section of Gen Genesis. Kings David and Solomon were very rich. So there's nothing wrong with being rich, so long as we listen to God's word about being rich. So what, what is God, God calling on us to do? Listen to him. Paul tells the young pastor, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. In those few words, God tells us about two big dangers of wealth. One is arrogance. I am richer than you, therefore I am better than you. I should have my opinion heard more than you. That's arrogance. The Lord teaches us that all of us are sinners in the eyes of God. All of us deserve eternal punishment in hell for our sins. There is no room for arrogance no matter how rich or poor we might be. And when we look at the words of Jesus, Jesus tells us that God is the owner of everything. We are simply stewards, and Jesus also adds, to those I give much, I also expect much. But even more important is that all of us, rich or poor, are sinners. The other danger that wealth puts on the table is that Wealth for us human beings is so uncertain. My grandfather got quite an inheritance from his father. I think we would consider him a millionaire in today's world. That was in the 1920s. He invested it. I know most of you know the 1929 story. And he was one of those casualties. 
He had his money in the wrong place, and he pretty much lost everything. In a blink, it was gone. We don't have to go very far back in history to see how some lost huge chunks of their retirement or lost their homes because of the stock market or real estate market or banking market turned on them. That uncertainty that God talks about can also be seen in the warning about health. You can have all the money in the world, you don't have health or you don't have life. You can't enjoy it, it goes to someone else. Jesus spoke about the farmer who amassed his wealth and sat back and was just simply gonna enjoy life. And he took, God took his life, reminding all of us about the evil of being wealthy and not being rich toward God. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout like wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So instead, God tells us, commend those who are rich in this present world to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's truly life. To be able to enjoy whatever God has given us and say, Thank you, Lord. And to when we pray the Lord's Prayer, to really think about that daily bread that he gives us. And to think about the truth that he gives us far more than our daily bread. And by saying, thank you, Lord, we are looking on the things that we have, the things we're given, as truly gifts from God. So God, when we think of his gifts to us and being in need, when we were still sinners, God says, Christ died for us. And God gave us a wonderful gift that we didn't deserve in the least. For it is by grace you have been saved by faith through grace. And it's not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, not by anything we have done, so that no one can boast. When we get to heaven, our boasting is in Jesus. It's not in ourselves or wise decisions. <coughs> it's a gift from God. And last but not least, doing good is one of the side reasons for God, or why God brought us to faith. Paul says, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, when we think of wealth, God is not saying to us that we should give away all our wealth. We don't have to give to every charity that holds out its hand. And I don't think God is asking us to squander our or to give a lot of what we have to someone who's going to squander it. Although may, maybe paying for counseling sessions might be a good thing to do. Somewhere between helping just a little bit here and there and helping a lot here and there um, is where God would want us. We might help, want to help a lot of people with a little or we might want to help one or two in a more substantial way. I had a wealthy farmer in my congregation came to me and asked, is there someone in our church who really could use some help? And I said, I have a member who has very little oil left left to heat his home. And that farmer went and he contracted with someone to go and fill that for him. Now, that's something that he could do. I had another one who asked if they could help him. 
had another person that was pretty needy and he had a bad back and his snowblower had just um, gone out. He had no money to do it. He had to do it by hand. And that week before, all he had, we had a foot of snow that day. And he's trying to, to do this long, fairly long driveway by hand to get his car out for his wife to go to work. He was handicapped. And we had a member who bought a snowblower for, for him so he wouldn't have to do it by hand. Um, we might help a lot of people with a little or help one or two in a more substantial way. We can give of our time, our talents, or treasure. I had a lady in my church. They weren't very well off at all. But she could give of her time. And she was a Sunday school teacher, director of our vacation Bible school. We had a vacation Bible school. We brought Camp Philip down. We had up to 60 kids, most of whom were not our members. And she was the coordinator for that. In our church at Bethany, we have two men, Brian and Bob. They're great. <laughs> One of the first, two of the first people I got to know. And you want, anytime, anytime you have a problem at church or at school or even for yourself, <laughs> um, you ask one of them, it's going to get done. They're handy men. They could use their talents to help the church. And we talked about the treasure as well. The biggest thing that God wants us to see within us is an unselfish heart. Paul continues, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Real enjoyment of our wealth is not just found in the pleasure we get from being wealthy. Real enjoyment is found in doing the Lord's work in the church, in our families, in our home, in our neighborhood. It's also found in the joy we bring to others' hearts and in the opportunity we get to tell someone that, we're sim that we are simply sharing the wealth that God has given us through Jesus. Remember Jesus' words, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're doing it to the glory of God. And if they know that, they're going to praise the God whom we worship. Giving God the glory is, so, is really important in life for he has done great things for us. And let's also remember the words of Jesus that when, when we help others, it counts as if we were helping him. Live the life that is truly life. We talked about that this morning. And I looked up as I came to, as I looked through this the last time this morning, it reminded me of a passage. And the Lord blessed me and almost where I flipped the Bible to in Matthew. Found the passage, come. You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when someone was hungry, you fed them. When they were thirsty, you gave them something to drink. You visited them in prison. There were a number of examples there. And whatever you did for the least of them, you did for me. And that's the life that is truly life for me. God brings us eternal life as a gift for believing in our Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I believe we continue. Please rise for prayer. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. 
You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold up offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be you. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help heaven and your soul. Heavenly Father, we again ask you to bless our church with a new pastor. We trust your spirit will bring us the very servant we need as we seek to serve you at this time and in this place. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Let us join in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good morning again. Um, it was a pleasure to be able to preach to you. The last time I did this was the last time I was here. And I was trying to think of when that was, and I'm guessing last year, maybe in January. Um, it's been a long go. I've had a lot of health problems that's affected um, my balance, um, just being able to stand doing the benediction is, the, is a little bit of a struggle, but I can do it now. And it was, for me, it was a pleasure to be able to see I could do a church service again. I've done a couple Bible classes at, at my home church to help out, but, um, you know, the Lord blesses us when, when he can, and I'm happy to, happy to start preaching again. Um, as a letter he'd like to read to you. This is a letter from uh, Pastor Dave Schneider. Um, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you again for the honor and privilege to consider serving among you at Christus. The information you provided on the history and future ministry opportunities as a, Christ as a congregation were clear and helpful in my deliberations. I also enjoyed the conversations with you by phone. My conversations with Pastor and Mark reaffirmed the wonderful reputation your congregation has. It is apparent that you are truly blessed as a congregation with a godly desire to share the gospel with your community. I am confident that at this time, I need to continue serving God at Cross of Christ, which we have a new sanctuary and classroom building 
and the Lord has renewed my call here. I need to continue the work here and encourage and support our ministry momentum with the many worship guests we are receiving. I will keep you in my prayers as you patiently wait for the Lord to answer your call for a pastor. As you know, he will provide what is needed in his time to bless you and keep you. Encourage each other with God's loving promises and know that he is leading you to a deeper trust in him. And then he's got this passage, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Jeremiah 29, 11. In Christ alone, Pastor Dave Schneider. So what that means is uh, we'll have another call meeting here in a couple of weeks, probably, or a week or two. Um, I'll be contacting uh, Pastor um, Jensen. I've already reached out to him, and he's given me some dates, so if the church council members would just hang around for a few minutes after the services, and we'll pick a date. Um, so uh, this is in God's hands, so don't uh, get down. Uh, there's a lot of vacancies out there right now in, in our synod, and uh, you know, we still have a pastor. We're not without yet, but it's coming. And so let's pray, 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 pray and God will provide. Okay?